Um, so it's a great pleasure that I can introduce you to Katie Bilotti of, I think that's how to pronounce the name. Is it is, that's it. From Royal Holloway. I am. And Katie's just, just a second told me that you're submitting your thesis tomorrow. I'm, I'm submitting the, the rough draft twice. Okay. Tomorrow. So and, right. and you still take time to, to come along and, and talk to us. So you better tell us what your thesis is about. My, my thesis is about contemporary performances of Greek tragedy in Latin America. So Latin America is sort of broadly defined to be sort of all Iberian-esque culture in the mm -hmm. New World, mm -hmm. um, in the Americas. So we have some, we have lots of stuff from Argentina and Mexico clearly, but also um, some Chicana, Mexican-American um, playwrights in the United States. And there's so, a lot of um, activity, is there? Yeah, no, there's a lot. A lot more than I thought. I was a little bit concerned, <laughs> right? Um, a lot more than I thought three years ago, uh, two and a half years ago. Um, yeah, there's a lot more than I thought. and. Um, it, it, it was really it was interesting, and there's I'm really into Latin America, and I grew up in uh, like a bilingual community, and I went to a bilingual primary school, mm -hmm. not intentionally bilingual, but um, it became bilingual. Yeah. <laughs> and I've always been really interested in Latin American culture and Mexican culture in particular, but I wasn't thoroughly confident there was a lot of Greek tragedy there. But there is, especially in the smaller theatres and these alternative theatres. And how, can you tell us a little bit about how they go about putting on Greek tragedies? What, well, what are some of the maybe distinctive features of, the, of this kind of theatre? Well, I think, I think what was the most interesting thing for me to discover was that it wasn't through sort of the Spanish tradition or from the United States that they were drawing most of their inspiration, mm -hmm. but clearly there is an engagement with the French neoclassical tradition, and that sort of became the, the center of my thesis, was talking about how the French neoclassical tradition is important not only in the reception of Greek tragedy in Latin America, but sort of Latin American intellectual life as a, as a counter to American cultural okay. in the region. So first of all, what is French neo what is the French neoclassical tradition? And then secondly, why? Why go to that particular um, well I when I talk about French neoclassicism and obviously this is a, the broad subject, I'm talking primarily about Racine mm -hmm. and Kanye. Um, but they in those sort of those sort of adaptations of Greek tragedy and um, also the French Enlightenment and the French Revolution, which has been very important in Latin American politics and the world politics, obviously. Um, but the reason is, I think that, you know, since the war, and this is mainly contemporary stuff I work on, that since after the war, France yep. has really set it up, set Which itself war? up, Second World War. <laughs> Sorry. Second but World we've war. had a few over here. Um, <laughs> since the Second World War, people have called this the war. Um, since the Second World War, France has really set itself up as a sort of anti-America, sort right. of counter right. to um, American cultural, um, Hegemony and political, you know, being difficult to the United States mm -hmm. is sort of part of French. And that's been quite attractive to them, to the... Yeah, well, uh, and I mean, if you live in Latin America, um, you know, the, being annoying to the United States seems like a really good idea. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a lot of good authority that at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, there's a children's game where you can decide whether or not to invade Granada. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've never been to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. I have no intention well, it's, of it's going. obviously one for the tourists. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think when you have I mean, U.S. incursion to the region for you know, 200 years, it's yeah. been ridiculous. Um, betraying my politics a little, it's absolutely ridiculous what the U.S. has done in the region. Of course, people want to reject that. Yeah. Especially sort of people who put on plays at black box theatres. <laughs> um, so yeah. And what form does this take then in, in these, can you give us some examples of, of how the this classical tradition has been filtered through this, the, the French tradition? Well I think, I think the most obvious way, um, the sort of easiest to see is um, just in the choice of plays and what plays have been chosen. Um, you get a lot, I mean, obviously you get a lot of Antigones everywhere, but you get a lot of Hecubas, which mm -hmm. is sort of distinctly, I think, French, mm -hmm. um, more French than sort of coming out of the United States, certainly, um, and it, the sort of Anglo-Saxon tradition in general. Um, you also see, in terms of storyline, if you look at like Phaedra's in um, Hippolytus' in Latin America, the storyline is following Racine's mm -hmm. storyline, mm -hmm. um, which is very distinct in many ways from from the ancient story. So there's, there is, it's obvious that that's what's being referenced, sometimes over the ancient source of play, which makes sense. It's a lot easier to read French if you're a native Spanish speaker than in Greek. Um, and you know, Latin's been taught in the schools there. 
And who's going to these performances? Um, I think predominantly sort of the urban middle class. Um, but what's interesting about Latin American society, I think the, the emergence of the middle class in Latin America, is that it's incredibly politically divided. Mm -hmm. And the division between right and left in many, many Latin American cities, I think is much starker than it is in a lot of places in the West, um, in the global north. And I think there's lots of reasons for that. I think one of them is the fact that the US you know, has bombed Colombia every day for 20 years. And whether or not you support that is a big deal. Yeah. But um, there is this, you know, there's this sort of emerging sort of left wing ish middle class mm -hmm. and a much more conservative middle class that does go to the national theaters. And that actually has been more interesting about putting on plays by national playwrights. Right, yeah. Um, and I was going to ask what role uh, the, these plays are, uh, are performing within uh, the culture more generally. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's a really interesting contrast is what's being performed at the national theaters, at, especially in like Colombia, let's say, yeah. where there's this US-backed government. Um, what's being performed there are predominantly plays by Colombian, new plays by Colombian playwrights, um, which is sort of the opposite of how you would think about it. But if, and that was really attractive for me, the idea of Greek tragedy as a sort of subversive thing. Um, so Greek tragedy is, is a genre to think with, exactly. in a way. It's, it, enables, it enables, I guess, um, groups of various kinds to think through the, the issues that are Exactly. The, the society is confronted. Exactly. I mean, the, the best example that I give everyone, um, and one of the, my favorite plays in the whole sort of the whole thing that I do that I was really into is um, Patricia Riza, who's a Colombian playwright, um, and a left-wing Colombian playwright, and has may or may not have been the subject of all sorts of harassment by the Colombian police, depending on who you believe, yeah. um, did an adaptation of the Antigone. And she went to the, this region in northern Colombia where right before she had arrived there had been a battle between, um, there's obviously rebels and stuff in the yeah. Colombia, um, between the rebels and the government. And the government had refused to allow the women from the village to go up into the hills to bury um, the men who had been killed. Right. In the <laughs> you and, know. Then, and then she turns out with Antigone. <laughs> yeah, she writes an Antigone. There was three, the play's done with three women playing Antigone. Yeah. Um, sort of Antigone having this conversation with each other. And the conversation they're having with each other is drawn from these interviews with these women about, you know, do we go up and bury this body? Um, is, you know, is it worth risking our safety? Does the movement die with us if we are, you know, if we're caught doing this? And it's, really, it's incredibly, you know, obvious where that's coming from. So. And how easy was it for you to find out about um, the, these uh, Is there any way... Uh, the internet. Internet, so that, that plays are being documented in some way? Yeah, I mean, you get a lot of, you know, I mean, some of the quality... I, I've actually got a lot of, you know, sort of videos sent to me. Not video videos, but, you know, digital video yeah. sent to me. Um, sometimes the quality is, you know, leads something to be desired. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, if you Google, like, you know, if you think of a play you want, and you just sort of, you know, put, you know, Antigona through um, Google and then, you know, Mexico or Colombia, stuff comes up. And these, because they tend to be these more kind of alternative theaters, they're on the internet. And there's this whole networks right. ad campaign. And, right. um, and they're delighted if you show the least bit of interest. And so they will send so you... So they have an audience in mind as well. And, it, yeah. and it's a global audience as much as a local audience. It's, exactly. And I think they're, you know, these are people who have... I think something that's unique about, not unique, but I think something that's different about sort of Latin America as a non-Western region as compared to other non-Western regions is that it's the oldest site of colonialism and there's a real tie to, you know, linguistically and culturally to the West. And there's a tradition of Latin American artists and intellectuals having this global appeal that goes back to, you know, 200 yeah. years, 300 yeah. years. So... Um, they're, they're used to that, and they want that, and they want, not just they don't want to just like break into the U.S. charts, like they want, <laughs> you know, they want the Garcia Marquez um, right. phenomenon of right. being, you know, Colombian right. with, you know, or being an Argentinian with an international. Yeah. Level. Now, this is the project that you're about to submit, at least the first draft of. What comes next? Um, the next thing is I am going to, this fall, start working on a project on the reception of Greek myth 
in contemporary Iranian and Iranian diasporatic literature, primarily novels, um, but there is some theater that I'm interested in. And how the hell did you get onto this topic? <laughs> um, well, I've always, I did some Farsi starting at high school um, because I was a contrarian. I mean, just to be difficult. <laughs> you know, they had, I got done with all my French classes and they had to sort of accommodate me because of some, you know, and so I was like, Farsi now, because um, I was a pain in the butt, basically. Um, and I've always been interested in Farsi and in um, the language of the, in the writers of the Iranian diaspora in particular. Um, my, I mean, the truth be told, my grandfather's business partner and best friend is Iranian. Right. And so I had, you know, growing up, I had this, this family that I really liked and knew, and that was my first exposure to sort of, you know, was it to these kind of, you know, kidnappers or this kind of scary nuclear power. It was these really, really nice people who, frankly, had more in common. My mother's family is Greek, and frankly, had more in common with our family than the sort of, you know, wasp people surrounding us in the suburbs of Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Um, and I really liked them. And... I got into Farsi, I got into Farsi literature, and I start, they start when they go to Iran and, or they pick something up, um, occasionally they would sort of mention to me because I knew I liked Greek tragedy stuff. Um, and that was, that was cool. And I sort of thought this was something that was relevant in a way. I think the conversation between the West and Iran needs to change. Um, and it's also really, really interesting. Right, so what, what kind of material are we talking about here? Um, well, as like I said, predominantly novels. Um, and there's this whole body of post-1979, I mean, I'm looking at stuff that's post-1979, post-Islamic Revolution. Um, there's this incredible body of literature being produced in Iran and outside of Iran um, in, in Farsi and in sort of the languages of host countries. Which, by the way, there's a way to speak Swedish out there. A Swedish novel, I kind of need. Looked that over for me. Um, and there's this whole host of literature that references Greek tragedy or references Greek myth and reference, or references sort of the history between Persia and the West and the Battle of Marathon and Herodotus, which is huge. Right. Um, really? This so it's it's conversation uh, about her. I am sponsored from the other perspective. Exactly, and this, I mean it's really great to you know there, there was this horrible reaction to three hundred, understandably, <laughs> in Tehran, and I mean you know of everyone had that reaction I think, um, but there's this other conversation. I think that one of the things I have just sort of my sort of preliminary you know to write the proposals for these things, I've discovered is the I think the average. Iranian writer or intellectual has more to say about Herodotus or thinks more about Herodotus more often than most Westerners do. Um, I think in most, unless you're sort of a nerdy classicist, Herodotus drops out of your consciousness of the sh history of the world. But you know, what Herodotus said and the way he told that story is important to Iranians. And do you have any specific example? I know this is yeah, you're only beginning yeah. the project. Um, there's I think the the best example is the story story um, that was sort of told simplest example was sort of told um, in one of the famous travel logs about Iran about getting into a taxi cab in Iran and a man being asked where he's from and he said England and the he said well what do you think about what's going on and the man said oh you know you try to when you're traveling and. The guy said, the taxi driver said, oh, I think this is all Herodotus's fault. You know, he lied. And the, the idea that a taxi cab driver would be like, <laughs> I think Herodotus did yeah. this. That was just an example from, from literature. But I think that's really um, sort of indicative of the, co the pervasive consciousness of that, of Marathon, of, that is more part of the, the conversation than it is here. And will you be going? I will be. Um, thanks to the British Institute for Persian Studies, I will be spending six months in Tehran. Fantastic. Um, and you have people to uh, connect with them? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have um, people who work on classicist, Iranian classicists, um, and people who work on Iranian, um, medieval Iranian poetry. Um, so yes, I will be, I'll be working on a sort of 
beginning of the project, you're looking at the sort of initial Byzantine and has the same engagement with each other. Right. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to go. Well, perhaps we can have you back when you, you've done a little bit more digging and you've got some good examples to share with us. Yeah, I, I'm excited to go. So. Fantastic. Well, many thanks for Thank for, you. for talking with us and getting us, well, getting me at least very interested in what's going on in South America and Iran <laughs> with uh, with Greek stuff. <laughs> with Greek stuff, yeah. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Katie. Thank you.